we uh, listen to librarians talk about writing their books, it doesn't sound exciting to <laughs> some people, but to us and you guys, I hope it sounds really exciting. So uh, let me, again, just welcome you guys. Thanks for coming out. I've been to a lot of your book clubs and seen a lot of you. It's good to see you, and, and thanks, Annie, for making the trip down to the Low Country. Thanks for having me. You said you've been to Charleston before, mm -hmm. but that was a, your, the extent of your coastal empire. Yeah. Uh, experience. Okay, well, you, you're deep in it now. This is the heart of the low country, yeah. I would say. Um, do you know what pluff mud is? Yes. That question I did not send you in advance, and I just decided. <laughs> to... um, is it the mud in the yeah. salt marshes? Correct. Is this the salt marsh mud? <laughs> you are now an honorary resident. <laughs> Yeah, oh, there you go. Very You're truly not an honorary resident until you bathe in the plus <laughs> <laughs> I describe it as sweetly selfless. So. Um, well, I, I want to know a little bit about you. I was telling Annie, I know some of you will have read the book, uh, Dear Fahrenheit 451. I'm going to abbreviate the title as such. Um, I had a long title when I wrote my book, and they cut it to one word. So <laughs> they must not have liked it that much. No, uh, I, they added to mine. I think they didn't think people would know what it was about. So they went the opposite. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I was too ex uh, I explained too much of my time. Yeah. They were like, you've, you've given it all away. So. <laughs> but I, I kind of wanted to start and lay out just so, so people who haven't read the book will get some background, and then we'll kind of get in. If you have read the book, we're going to touch on some things uh, that you might recognize. So just uh, tell us a little bit about uh, you know how did you become a librarian, uh, and how did that get into writing for you? Uh, what was that process like? Sure. I've always been a writer. I always wrote short stories or, um, I mean, these little zines, um, uh, which are little homemade magazines. Um, but then I was a creative writing major, and it's kind of hard to get a job. <laughs> when, uh, I'm right here with you. Yeah, I was a bachelor's in English. <laughs> yeah. So about halfway through college, my mom said, what are you going to do when you get out? And I was like, I don't know. Um, and my advisor was sort of gave me a list of things I could do if I loved books and um, wanted to serve the public and librarian was number one. And um, So kind of a light bulb went off in my head like, oh, I, I can do that. I, I can help my community and still be surrounded by books and um, have some off time to write. So that's how I became a librarian. I, had a, I, still, I was a bachelor's in English uh, right here at USCB, uh, right here in town. And uh, freelance writing always sounded so romantic and sexy. Yeah. But um, then once you graduate, you realize it's going to be a struggle to, to make a living on that. So my mother was a librarian, sister was a librarian. Uh, just saw what they were doing, you know, just such a mix of, of cool things. It's not just books. It's your, your computers and multimedia and presentations and talking and, and interacting with the public. So that, that's a similar story there. Um, you wrote Fahrenheit, for, uh, Dear Fahrenheit 451. Uh, have you written anything else before that other than like your zines? Have you published anything or any magazines or stories? Or anything? Never published anything. I wrote a young adult novel when I was in college that never got published. Before. Right, right. So I should say, I wrote a Microsoft Word document in college. Yes. <laughs> I've written several Microsoft Word documents. <laughs> They've got great titles. <laughs> Uh, this was my first published book as well, so, so we're both debut novelists. Now, I have to ask, I'm going to get a little technical, and you can stop me if this is too personal, but uh, did, did you, how did you get in with Flatiron Books? <laughs> did you have um, an agent, or did you seek an agent? I did not seek an agent, but I, I got an agent. I, wrote, I worked for the Traverse Area District Library in northern Michigan, and um, my boss, who's in the other yellow dress up there, was... Um, <laughs> gracious enough um, to let me have some creative freedom, and I uh, wrote a blog for the website recommending books to readers. And um, when I recommended a book, I would email the author and say, hey, look at our blog, we recommended your book. Uh, well, once I couldn't find the author, she didn't have an online presence, so I looked in the back of her book and saw that she thanked her agent, and I wrote her agent and said, we've recommended your client's book. And her agent wrote me back unbelievably, and said, I really like your writing. Have you ever thought of writing a book? Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. That truly is amazing. Because the, the mathematics of acquiring a literary agent are just, it's, it's infinitesimal, the chance that Yeah, and I bet if I queried her, I would have never heard back. It just, just flat out rejected. Yeah. I bet she said so, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, congratulations. You have a UK edition out? Yeah. I just said, is that recent? I saw the picture on the website. Um, the UK edition came out in the spring, and there'll right. be a copy um, in, printed in Arabic. Oh, nice, yeah. nice. They, yeah, they picked Minnow up in, in the French, and it was just such a thrill 
So you can read the UK edition of your book, but when it comes out in Arabic, it's going to be really interesting. Do you read Arabic? No. Okay. So, uh, it'll be really. It'll be yeah. I don't assume. It'll be really interesting to sit down and look at it in another language, because yeah. because I, I sit down and I look at my French edition, and it's it's, it's almost uh, almost so really disturbing because you feel like you can't read. It's like you get that almost disturbing feeling of I can't access my own story. Uh, but uh, and what else is in the works? I'm, I'm sort of hitting these classic beginning of interview questions. What else is in the works? Um, I'm trying to write a novel. And I'm pregnant and I have pregnancy brain, so it's quite hard. <laughs> I saw in an interview, the front porch interview, you said you were having anxiety about having an old house that's falling apart. So I, this is in a public interview. Old house that is falling apart. You've got your spouse, your son, another one on the way, and a cat. And you're trying to write a book. Yes, and they're all driving me crazy. The worst you is anxiety, <laughs> and I understand that. I have an old house that's falling apart, a spouse, a son, two dogs, um, and not one on the way, though. Uh, and it is anxiety. Yeah, okay. I'm about a third of the way through the draft of it. Do we so get any teas or any? Well, I like uh, women's fiction, um, and I, I love those stories of women going on sort of a redemptive journey when they have some sort of crisis in their life. But often they're flying to Jamaica or they're going off to Europe for the year or living in a cabin out north. And I lack empathy for them because I can't do that. <laughs> so um, my book will be about, so far, a woman that has a crisis in her life, but she's got to keep her crappy job and take care of her kids and work through her stuff at the same time. You said you like, a, I'm, I don't get it wrong, like a mundane life world where something like magical happens? Is, is that That's happening? my favorite kind of book. That's your favorite kind of book. Is that happening in your book at all? Or There's no magic so no far. No magic so far. <laughs> but as I know from writing my book, you never know the magic's going to come in. Okay, uh, well, uh, so tell us how did Dear Fahrenheit 451 come about? Um, for, in one of my first jobs at a public library, one of my friends, just reminded me that my actual first job as a public library was as a, as a security monitor. <laughs> An important job. That's a critical job. They didn't do so hot at. But um, at one of my other first public library jobs, we had this table of free books that were they didn't even think would sell in the book sale that were discarded from the library. Ouch. And one of them was the, it, which is a letter in the book was Pictorial Anatomy of the Cat, which was like a book about how to dissect. That was a great <laughs> book. And no reason that should be in the public library. And later in my library in life, we had a man who we were pretty sure might want that book. <laughs> so I wrote a letter to that book for my own amusement. And, and every once in a while, when you're a librarian, you come across a book that's just like, how did this get written? Why is this in the library? Who chose this? Um, and so just for fun, I had a little collection of those letters to books. Um, and so when my agent said, have you ever thought of writing a book? I said, I got to write back to this woman before she forgets about me. Um, and so I sent her a long list of book ideas and I added a couple of those letters in at the end just to sort of fill it out. I didn't think she would hook onto that. And she said, oh, that that's that's what I want to read. I want to read more of those letters. So, so she really liked your concept. That was yeah. sort of like, mm -hmm. yeah. As a librarian, we see so many books and mm -hmm. I, I always get jealous when I see a good concept. Uh, there was a children's book that came through my library the other day called uh, School's First Day of School. And oh, I said, that's such a neat idea. Yeah, you like that one? Yeah. It's so cute. Uh, so, well, I'm always looking for concepts and uh, you know, what's going to be the next kind of twist we can do. But, uh, uh, so we, we know how you got Derek Fahrenheit 451 out there. Uh, what's your favorite job about, uh, part about being a librarian? Um, there's many favorite parts to being a librarian. Uh, and I work in public libraries. I like the creative freedom I have there because um, I'm an outreach librarian. So I'm tasked with just getting new programming ideas and new ways to get people into the library. I love when people do come to the programs and thank me. I love telling people about things. Uh, things we have that are useful to them that they never knew existed. It's like giving somebody a present. Um, those are my favorite things. You know i got to ask you the least favorite thing. Kicking teenagers out. <laughs> <laughs> the adults will go, but the <laughs> teenagers are harder. I feel your pain. <laughs> yeah, Mine's kicking kindergartners out. <laughs> no, they don't get to come. <laughs> uh, uh, so least favorite part. Uh, tell me then the synergy of being a librarian and a writer, because I know for me it's a really special thing. 
I tell the kids and I tell people who ask me, I, I live amongst the books like uh, the fantastic Mr. Uh, Lesmore. And I get to be around stories and, and read stories and, and I get to tell stories and then practice. Uh, reading out loud, you get to practice that voice, that author's voice. And I, I don't mean like doing silly voices, which I do, but just the voice of a character. So that's something that works for me really well as a librarian is I get to sort of see all these different authorial voices. What, what synergy do you feel being a librarian and a writer? How does that come together for you? Um, when I got into working in the library, I thought it would be being surrounded by books and that they would sort of be a muse for me. But working in the public library, it's really more the people that come in um, because it's everybody from your community and from other communities. And I've worked at maybe 10 different libraries in the last decade. <laughs> I had a hard time. <laughs> I can get fired. I, I, I realize I'm not a lot of words to work at. I know on. people like that. <laughs> um, but it's the people that come in. They're so different, and you know, you're you're a little closed off. Everybody in your neighborhood is makes about the same income, and and they might differ a little from you. But uh, when you're a public librarian, you see people from all walks of life, and so those are the stories that sort of inspire me. I want to back it up a little bit. You said you've been writing your whole life. Uh, I've been writing my whole life too, just like little things and you know, notebook papers. What, what did you like to write about when you were a kid? Were you writing when you were a kid? Yes, I like to write about ice skaters and leprechauns. Oh, nice. <laughs> and books. I, I found a, a little book I had written um, when every time I come up to my parents' house, they give me a box of crap. They made me take home. And I imagine. <laughs> it like a floppy disk and a homecoming corsage or something. Um, but I found this little book that I had made in third grade and it, it said if I was a leprechaun, if a leprechaun gave me a wish and I said I would swim in golden books, that was my, my wish. <laughs> little golden books, you would swim like, like a Scrooge McDuck, but yes. instead of money, it's so golden books. books. Yeah. Okay, that says a lot about you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, we, my sister and I used to make up stories about our stuffed animals. So like whatever brand, we would have some gummy bear stuffed animals, we'd make stories of them, you know, teddy bears and things. So that's, that's where we, we started. Yeah. Um, so one of the things your book does, and if you've read it, you know this, uh, it's, it's, re it's almost like a reader's advisory. So one job of, of a librarian is to just interact with patrons and help them find the books they want. Uh, and this is a great job at doing that. It really is, much of it is, not all of it is just sort of, I, I read it, and I want to read a million books in there. And I'm like, man, I haven't read anything. Like, all I read is picture books and uh, scary squirrel. But uh, so, give me some tips, or give everybody some tips, because we've got book clubbers in here. Whether you're a writer or a reader or a librarian or just a mom or a dad, like, what? How do you get so inspired to give such great readers advisories? Because it's a hard part of the job. We're yeah. just talking about that. Um, it, it is a hard part of the job um, because not everybody has the same taste as you which I've learned because I really love the virtue suicides and I get a lot of letters. I picked up on that. They, I hate that book. I tried it again after reading your book and I hate it still. Uh, I would say read widely and when someone's talking to you about a book they like, librarians try to pay attention to how they say they felt and that's how I wrote the book too. I, fir I first thought about how the book made me feel and then sort of delved into plots. Um, because there are people um, that come into the library that want book suggestions that haven't read a book in years. And so then we have to go off, like, what was your favorite movie? What TV show do you like? And if they like something, if they say something was thrilling, you know, they want a fast paced book. If they say they cry, you know, they want a more emotional book. Um, so I try to pay attention to those kind of keywords. Right, you speak to that, and there's a section in the book where it's people who haven't read a book in forever. But it's, it's just sort of a, a lot of what line they might give you, and then you can build off of that, like a, the last good meal I ate or something like right. that, and then we'll find a good book for them. That, that is a talent, that is a skill that has to be cultivated uh, over time. You, you, know, you think, oh, I love books, I love writing, I should be able to hop in and just pick the best book for everybody, but it, it really is a, a cultivated talent. And yeah. I, I admire your skill there. Thank you. Um, related to that, I'm going to skip ahead to this question. Um, I'm a librarian. Uh, which is a, a slightly <laughs> rare breed, and I'm in a position to encourage young readers, which is where we, I think we start the love of reading. We were talking about how our love of reading came from reading as children, our mothers read to us, our, you know, our families were readers. Uh, you mentioned, uh, and this, caught, this really perked up my ears, every third male who comes into your library, the last good book they read was Hatchet. 
Which I love. I'm a huge Hatchet fan. It's a good book. It's a great book. I doubt it. Why do you think that is the last good book they read? And how can we get boys to read? How can we get anyone to read young people? I think they just need to read something they love. I think a lot of parents come in and they want their kid to read the book they loved when they were a kid. Or they don't want them to read the Lego comic book. They want them to read something of substance. And they have to start with what they love. And then they can move on to that. But the, they have to love reading before they start to, to read more widely. And I don't know why people stop reading a hatchet. <laughs> Maybe Gary Paulson needs to come out with some books for adults. <laughs> right. There's plenty to read after hatchet yes. in the series. Uh, you mentioned Lego comic books. What's your feeling? What's your take on uh, on I bet I know, but uh, as far as taste, and uh, is, do you do you ever steer people away from something? In a school library, you get a lot of you know teachers. Let's say I'm not I'm not trying to talk bad about teachers, love them, but they're like, oh, I don't want them reading the graphic novels. I don't want them to get a book that's based on the Avengers or, or what have you. And, and I try to find a balance of not stocking my library with Disney characters, right, but yeah. I want to have a balance of of classics and good literature, but also I, I want to have the Avengers easy reader, and I want to have uh, My Little Pony Easy Readers, because that's so high interest. You know, How do you feel about that? Is there a, a line you draw, or is it just whatever they want? Uh, I, we, I really try to give kids whatever they want. And, uh, or adults. But, but I do, and adults as well. I do try to encourage them to, to move past it once they've enjoyed, you know, even if it's baby steps. And I love reading comic books and graphic novels um, myself, so I, I never discourage those. I just try to get them to pick out a a variety. Get the book you want, but then pull something that um, you might not know if you like to. And I think um, the public library has made it really easy to put books on hold from home, or to you know you read a review and then you can put that book on hold and you don't have to go into the stacks. You just walk into the library, give them your name, and pick it up, um, which is really convenient. But I wish I would like people to browse more because I found a lot of books that way, just walking around in the stacks. Um, and something's got a cover or, or a name that I'm interested in. And Serendipity. Yes. Just just yes. walking through the stacks and then something looks out at you. I, I love the public library. I love good display because I can just see what what's, what the librarians are recommending and suggesting. Okay. We were at the my local public library the other day, and my, we, we left, and my wife sort of leaned in my ear and whispered. She said, Jeff, I, I took a bunch of books from the display, and I feel really bad. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, no. no. Oh, the display is there to take. They want you to empty the display out so they know their display was good. You know, but she felt bad that she had wrecked their beautiful. No, we're always making signs that say, "Take me, take please, me, take please. me." Yes, I put dollar bills in the book sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure. Yes. So we appreciate the work you do. Um, you know, to just put the good stuff out there. You know, show us the good stuff. In the same way that in a school library, my TA is so good about sort of curating the tops of the shelves. It's you know the, the best books on top. So they're looking right at you, and you don't always have to go in and know what you want or, or search. You can just sort of see something that's good. I, I crossed the line the other week uh, at the library um, because this little boy comes in all the time. He loves to read, and his dad told him that the librarians only let you check out three books at a time. And I said, it's 50. <laughs> <laughs> I heard him say the next time he came in, the librarian said it's 50, Dad. Uh, <laughs> you can check out 50 here. That scares me. 50 books. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, here's my heavy hitter here. Um, we're in crazy times right now. What do you see? Do you see yourself? One thing you said in the book was that your one of your powers is that you can provide uh, readers with whatever they need, whatever they want to learn. You can provide a book for that. And that's a huge thing I tell every class, every time I meet them, I say, you're in the library and we're here to read, but my superpower, my skill is that I can help you learn whatever you want to learn more about. You might learn about this in PE, you might learn about this in art, but if you want to continue that beyond what your art teacher has time or supplies for, I can empower you to do that. And that's something you said too, is that you, yeah. people come in and you can use them whatever. Do you see yourself as a potential agent for social change uh, or revolution? Yes. <laughs> I do a quiet revolution. Um, nice. And we were just talking about this last night. A lot of library programs are focusing now on how to teach people um, what a well-sourced news article looks like, um, 
how to spot fake news, how to do research. Um, so I think we can be really helpful in that aspect. And then also just when people fall on hard times, sometimes the only place left to go is the, the library. There's no other place that you can go where you don't have to buy something or believe in something in order to be let in the doors. Um, and so I hope the public library will always be a place like that. Um, but, you know, so I kind of try to keep it under wraps. Right. <laughs> I especially have to. I want the I, people to know. I work with, with children, and the parents don't want to, to know that I'm revolutionary uh, in the library. <laughs> <laughs> they call it something different. But I mean, you know, I, I think back to... Uh, I think back to the Patriot Act and sort of the power that librarians had there where, you know, all of a sudden uh, we might get a knock on the door and be asked to divulge information that's private and personal. So what did, what did we start doing? We started destroying the information so that they couldn't, they couldn't come knock on the door. You know, so I just, I, I'm proud uh, to be a librarian and I appreciate what you do as a public librarian. You really are on the front lines of, of what we need right now, I think more than ever is how do we get through this world of information, this world of news? How do we navigate that? And how can we help people who need the most? So thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> All right, that was the heavy stuff. That was the heavy stuff. Uh, so I, I have a few questions that might ring a bell to people who've read the book a little more, but hopefully you'll enjoy them. Um, do you, do you want to do, do, do my rapid fire? I didn't know if I was going to hit yeah. you with the rapid fire. Yeah. You ready? OK, funniest book. Heartburn by Nora Ephron. Heartburn by Nora Ephron. Okay, I like uh, Catch-22, uh, Breakfast of Champions, Cruel Shoes, Steve Martin. Scariest book? Um, I was gonna say... This is a hard one. Handmaid's Tale. Oh. Uh, misery was very scary. I write, I write about misery in the book. And the I main character, yes. the, the crazy lady in that book is named Annie, which makes it <laughs> I put Cujo down just because it's sort of oh, visceral. Yeah, so I was a little boy when I read it. I was a little boy in that book. And, uh, and American Psycho. Have you ever read American Psycho? No. Yeah. You haven't? Put <laughs> um, it on your list. Yes. <laughs> Brett Ellis Easton, right? Yeah, he went to school with Donna Tartt. Right. So like, I'll read anything connected to Donna Tartt. Right, well, well yes. <laughs> Brace yourself. Um, most difficult book? Like, I don't know how to, like, the most difficult book you've ever read or a book you've put down? I don't know. Here's one that's both. Um, the Golden Notebook by Doris Lessing was a very good book. It's like seven or 800 pages, and I read five or 600 pages before I dropped out because it was making me go crazy. The main character in the book is slowly losing something, and I was right there with her, so I had to get it. Right. I'll, I'll give the Bachelor's of English answer and say Ulysses. That's my favorite, yeah, that's my favorite yeah. hard book. And you could read that forever. Desert Island books. I mean, that's a hard one for a librarian. Two, three that you just would want to take. Virgin Suicides. <laughs> Virgin Suicides, Dandelion Wine by Ray Bradbury, which is also one of my favorite books. Um, I take Heartburn for the Laughs. Um, Grace, Grace Paley is one of my favorite authors. Um, I have a book of her collected works. And I guess I would need something light on a desert island, but I don't read much light. Sedaris, maybe? Oh, yeah. Sedaris. 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 My wife is a huge sure, Sedaris. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would want to take just like books that I've read many, 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 many times. How to start a fire. Oh, yeah. okay. how, to start, <laughs> how to get off the desert island. Both buildings with sand 101. Um, yeah, I, I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan. You can read that book a thousand times. It just kind of sucks something different See out something of it. See something different. Yeah. different. I, I would want a Flannery O'Connor story collection. Is that cheating to do story collections? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, speaking of that, speaking of that um, you mentioned several books in here that you read uh, yearly almost. You, maybe at least one book I think you remember. You said you, you read every year. Sometimes I'll try to hit Lord of the Rings uh, yearly. I can't always, just depending on what life is doing. What, what's your thought on uh, reading a book way more than once? Well, I have what I call book anxiety, which is like I've got so many books I want to read, and I just don't know when I'm going to have the time to read them. But I do read these books over and over because you can find something new in them. I, I read Wuthering Heights almost every fall. Yeah, um, yeah. And I read, I try to read Dandelion Wine every summer. Um, so, so I'm for it. it's seasonal. Yeah. It's like a seasonal thing where yeah. you do research. I'm real seasonal about okay. my book. Right. 
how about bad books? Because Stephen King and On Writing, which is maybe my favorite book about books, it really inspired me to write. I got it for Christmas from my mom one year, and it really took me off. Uh, he, he said he, uh, he, doesn't, he reads so many books, and his pile is so high, his queue is so high, that he doesn't have time to waste on, on a bad book. He's going to close it and move on to something that has more possibility. What, what are your, as a librarian, sometimes you have to read bad books. What are your thoughts on that? No, you don't. I don't. <laughs> you gotta get this enough, right, but right. you don't have to read it. Um, I quit them, I, and I just started this like maybe five years ago. I had a professor in college that said you had to read the whole book until you were 50, and then you could start skipping. <laughs> That's what Stephen King is getting at. Yeah, um, his years were limited. I I think I read enough to know where a book is going. Sometimes I'll read the end, um, just to like. <laughs> I, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. No. If I know when I'm going to quit, I'll just of? skim it, read the end, and then it will confirm to me that I felt like it was a bad book. And, um, but sometimes I quit reading books that aren't bad, that I'm just it's not my time for that book. I'm not in the mood. I can't. Interesting. Um, I, I, find, I, I find it hard to pick a book that I'm really into. And so when I read your book, I was like, man, she, she reads so many books. I need to try to read more books. Uh, but when I find a book I like, I tear through it. But for me, it's hard to find a good book, and that's why I love librarians. Oh, they yeah. Help me find yeah. Um, how about as a writer? Uh, is How does it feel? I, I, it feels good. You read a book that you know you could do better than? Like, have you ever had that experience? <laughs> well, not that I know I could do better than. Or I'm, that... Uh, I'm more often, I'm like, oh, man, I could never write something like this. Right. Um, <laughs> but sometimes... Just being a writer, you can see the structure of a book a little more, like you can see the skeleton or the bones, and that makes it a little less enjoyable. So right. I find less often okay, I feel yeah. like I'm being taken on a ride that I don't know where it's going. Yeah. So I really appreciate that when I read a book that I can't see the background of. Right, so you can kind of see how they did it, and you can kind of feel like, well, yeah, it's not, you're not being swooned as much. Yeah, once you go through it. the editorial process, you're like, oh, her right. agent should have told her she uses that word right. too much, or like, um, <laughs> So you can kind of like see that. I don't, and I don't like it. Um, I would rather go back to. Sure. I guess for me it was just like as you're getting rejected and rejected and rejected, <laughs> it's nice to look at the shelf and see some bad books up there and say, well, if they could get up there, maybe I can't look there too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Give me some references. I'm going to move on to some 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 quicker, lighter questions here. We'll get I'll get away from the revolutionary stuff. Um, I, I don't want to ask your age, but man, I just feel like we're locked on on generation. You mentioned Kids Incorporated. Oh yeah. Should we sing the theme song? <laughs> uh, you mentioned my, so, my so-called life. Mm -hmm. okay, so these are all things that really ring a bell. That was something my editor told me I mentioned Jared Leto too much. Jared, I, I, I really, really, really wanted to try to get to a print shop and bring you like a framed <laughs> gift of Jared Leto with that. That, with that furred cup, cup jacket he had. Yeah. It was so cool. What was up with Tino? He was never showed up on the show. What was up with Tino? Know. He never came. Uh, what book would you woo Jordan Catalano with? <laughs> uh, he was not a very big reader. No, he was like he was he was maybe a, dyslexic a little or? dyslexic. He had trouble reading. Yeah. Um, I guess I would That's start him question. on um, like a book that he could physically do something with, like a car repair manual. Yeah. Or I feel like he, was he might like to make jewelry or something. So yeah. a jewelry making book. He was in a band called Frozen Embryos. Yeah. yeah maybe maybe you could have done some music. Uh, now, you, you smack talk The Hobbit, <laughs> which I'm a big fan of. I don't know what your beef is with The Hobbit. Actually, I do know because I read the book. I'm just kidding. But then I saw in an interview, you mentioned you do watch Game of Thrones. I do. I'm, as a huge fan of fantasy, have you read A Song of Ice and Fire? You have. How do you think it ends? I plan, I plan to read it. I hope Jon Snow wins everything because I love him. He's yeah. so cute. What, what <laughs> yeah, I mean, winter is coming. <laughs> so I thought maybe um, Khaleesi could be the queen and Jon can like give her advice because she's really a better leader than he is, but he's so good. It's not happening. That's not going to be the end. I'm sorry. All right, then a spin off with Jon Snow. <laughs> because you like, because you like Jon Snow so much. Yeah. Will not be a happy ending. Um, how are your upstairs neighbors? We moved. You moved. Okay. <laughs> just moved. Okay. I wrote a letter to a book about my upstairs neighbors yeah. who were all there. Yeah, yeah, tell us a little bit about your upstairs neighbors. <laughs> they were young college age men, and they were quite loud. I mean, just parties every night, heating up uh, smelly food that you could smell, smoking a lot of pot. Yeah, that's what we're getting just at here. Yeah. Wafting under the door. 
Um, and I wrote a letter to the books that I imagine they have or that I wish they had. That was one of my favorite letters. It was, it was really I good. never told them, but they helped us move. Yeah. So. yeah nice, nice I, I thought you could slip, like slip like maybe a, a book about vaping under the door. So <laughs> maybe clear your house up a little bit. I'm glad you're out of that. Okay. They just put towels under the door. Yeah, <laughs> just towels under the door. Um, you, your husband really loved, you talk about your husband, your family, and, your, and so I'm a writer and a daddy and a husband and, all that too. So it really hit to me. I like to hear about your family a little bit. Uh, he loved Blood Meridian. Mm -hmm. That was a book that you hooked him with. He, now is he a, not much of a reader or is he a medium reader? He, or what? Um, he's a little similar to what you said. He doesn't read very often, but when he reads a book, he tears through and it. And he loved Blood Meridian. He loved Blood Meridian. That's one of my favorite books, if not my favorite. Uh, Cormac McCarthy, I think, is probably the greatest living American author other than us right now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> did you read Blood Meridian? You didn't no. seem into it. Okay. I was not I, the portion in the book he's referring to is I wrote, I gave my husband Blood Meridian so that he would be quiet so I could read my book. It, it is a dark, graphic book. But he liked it so much that he wouldn't stop talking to me about it. He would write a letter to Blood Meridian saying, keep it down, I'm trying to finish my book. Um, I want to read All the Pretty Horses. I was going to ask if you read any other Cormac McCarthy. And I, lo I love the movie No Country for Old Men, so I, I right, like to right. read that book. Um, since becoming a mother, I can't read stuff that's too dark. He read The Road, too. That's right. Cormac the Road McCarthy. is the top book for me, too. And I don't think I could read that. Have you seen the movie? Mother. The no, movie. I left the room when he watched that. The movie does an amazing <laughs> job of capturing the book. That's one of those ones where it's really a, a good, fair comparison. Love The Road, Love Blood Meridian, and All the Pretty Horses. I can't recommend it enough. You okay. really should read it. And it's yeah. part of the, the Border Trilogy, so mm -hmm. there's three books. I own it, and my goal for the winter is to read the book. The book yeah. that I actually own. It, it's Cormac McCarthy, but not as dark and gritty, so I think you should give it a shot. Nice. Um, you mentioned this uh, almost at the very end of your acknowledgments. Uh, in my house, we've cut the cord, so we don't do cable TV. So we watch a lot of YouTube shows, and we watch a lot of uh, ETV. Uh, one of our favorite shows is Daniel Tiger. Um, why doesn't he wear pants, but he wears a shirt? Because <laughs> he's a sock puppet. Okay. The legs are an improvement. What is your favorite Daniel Tiger lesson? Can you remember one that's really stuck home with you? Yes. If you have to go potty, stop and go right away. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one for mine. My, my, my job there, yes. I always like, you can be anything. You can be anything. Oh, yeah. And I just watched um, and would highly recommend the Mr. Rogers documentary, Won't You Be My Neighbor? Yeah, it's Tom Hanks. Yeah. yeah um, and, and we were saying that... Um, Daniel Tiger was Mr. Rogers. You know, that he, he sort of imagined himself as, as Daniel Tiger. Right. Right. So. Oh, again, our generation, Reading Rainbow, Mr. Rogers. Yeah. You know, so, so Daniel Tiger speaks to me. Yeah. Um, what is your policy on putting knickknacks and tchotchkes in front of books on bookshelves? I love knickknacks and tchotchkes. Who doesn't? They don't go in front of the book. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Otherwise. You can't get to that it's place. a struggle, but I, you know. But then you put one up there, and you think it's okay. I'll just move it. But then all of a sudden, you got all your Hummels. Yeah. <laughs> I was at a rummage sale with an, one of my in-law relatives. I won't say who. And she was looking at um, books and taking the jackets off of them. She picked up one. I don't remember what it was. I said, "Oh, that's that's a really good one." She said, "I I just need green and black books." <laughs> <laughs> Hurt me. You see, there's a skit, I can't tell you, there's a BBC uh, show, they did a skit I saw on YouTube where the library's organized by color. Have you seen that one? It's pretty funny. Oh, uh, you want the little skinny red book? Yeah, that's over there, you know? We have people tell us, I've had people ask that it be um, in order by title. And right. I just think, like, do you know how much of a mess that would be? Right, right, right. <laughs> we're, we're, we're struggling with that in, in school libraries. We're heading towards genreification and getting chapter books genreified, sort of. Oh, nice. That's something that we're trying to do. Um, you talk about snacks and food in here. Oh, what was the popcorn book? Popcorn. Um, corn's a popcorn. Corn's a popcorn. There's a, she writes a letter to a book all about corn snacks and, and corn foods. My editor wanted to cut that letter, oh. and I just... Editors. Just three times, I just deleted her note. <laughs> <laughs> and then she forgot about it. <laughs> well, let's clean up. Good tip. What's your favorite popcorn snack? Movie butter popcorn. Movie butter Movie popcorn. Okay. Microwave, or are you, you popping no. in the kettle or anything? We just pop it on the stove. It's oh. just as cheap and it's just as quick. That's I don't more know romantic. why microwave popcorn exists. That's, my, that's romantic. 
Uh, what's your relationship with food and books? And, like, do you like to eat while you read? Is there a book that makes you want to eat? When I was a kid, The Hobbit, we're coming back to The Hobbit, um, I would want to read that, and I would have a ball up piece of white bread and a hunk of cheese, and I, and I made my mom uh, make me tea, hot tea. And I'm like Southern boy drinking cold sweet tea. And she's you're not going to like that. You're not going to like hot tea. And then I was like, she's like, do you want cream in it? And I was like, no, I want it to be clear. And she was like, you're really not going to like that. So, But I got to sip my tea and have my hunk of bread and my cheese and go on my hobbit journey. <laughs> you know any stories like that? You got any books that both have an appetite in you or your um, like Snack water for chocolate. Oh, um, yeah. That book evokes an appetite. Yeah, when I was a kid, I was mostly just laying in the dirt reading. Yeah. I didn't think I brought any snacks yeah. with me, but I love to snack now. Yeah. I love to just eat anything. Sure. Yeah. My books are a mess. Yeah. I have my a, there's a little grease stain on the inside of the copy of your book that I own, but I just feel like it's a match. I really read it while I was eating sea salt and vinegar chips. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Last question, and I'd like to open it up for, for some folks out here to ask some questions. Uh, what What is your relationship with book clubs? What have they done for you? We're here for, for book club folks. I love book clubs because you get to meet people who've read the book, and you don't have to sell them on it. So that you've already convinced them, and you can sort of get into a, a deeper conversation. And you know, a lot of times as, as authors, we're expected to get up and, and pitch our books and sell our books and, right. and put it out there. But with a book club, that that's removed. And it sort of, to me, makes a more relaxing sort of feel. So how do you feel about book clubs? And what's your relationship with them? I love book clubs. I run a book club at work that meets at a bar. And it's a great way to get people of different ages together talking about wild things. We just read um, Just Kids by Patti Smith. And um, yeah. so we got to talk about everybody's advent youthful adventures. And um, it's, you would never have that discussion with another person if it weren't for that sort of format. And then I've also been invited to some book groups um, since I wrote the book and um, love going to those. They've got great snacks all the time. That <laughs> is <laughs> key. Yeah, cucumber water. Yeah. I was just rejected from a book club. A woman came into the library and my coworker recommended my book for her book club. Um, so we were scheduled to meet next month, and she just emailed me and said, your pitch didn't go over well, so you're scrapped. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> we'll end on that note. <laughs> we, we've got a little bit of time. I love my favorite part, and I don't like to hear what you think. My favorite part about doing any book event is when I get to stop feeling and talking and reading and have some hands go up and answer some questions yeah. is something that I like to do. Are you uh, copacetic with that right I'm now? I'm answering questions. Sure, yeah. we, let's do some questions. I just want to know where you're from, where you live. Oh yeah, oh, I should have said that. Uh, I'm from Michigan. I live in Gross Point Park, Michigan, which is right outside Detroit. Okay. I actually live one side, my side of the street is Gross Point, and the other side is Detroit. Okay, great. Right here? I want to know oh, if, if the woman who She goes, luckily, there are different staff, like different books, so she didn't have to come back to me. <laughs> she came back. There's a woman that liked um, uh, Fern Michael's book that was about uh, a woman falling in love with a Latin man, and they were kind of enemies, and then they fell in love. And so I just had this little devil on my shoulder that thought, <laughs> maybe she wants to read some heavy <laughs> So, I gave her, um, well, it wasn't Love in the Time of Cholera, it was, but it was by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. 100 years of solitude. 100 years of No, it was one of his thinner, lesser known books. It's in the book. It's about a. Read the book and you'll find it. It's about a priest that falls in love with a 12 year old that's imprisoned and has, he like picks her lice off her. It's disgusting. It's a little heavy. <laughs> it's. it's Gabriel Garcia Marquez's specialty, which is love among filth. Sure. Um, so I recommended that to her, and it just 
You don't always get it right on the first time. It's a done baby step. It's a conversation between patrons. And that'll always bite you when you make that decision, that split-second decision in your head. I'm going to give them a book I like instead of a book I think they'll like. Never. That's hard. That's where the reader's advisor is difficult for me because it's so hard to divorce yourself from your passions and what you like. And well, I like that, so they must like this too. But it's a cultivated skill. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Right here. Why is the title Dear Fahrenheit 451? And in fact, that's the first little snippet that I read, and I think that's one of the least interesting chapters. <laughs> the question was, why was the title Dear Fahrenheit 451? Why that letter? Yeah. Um, my editor chose. We wanted to name the name the book after a letter so that people would key into the fact that it was a book of letters. Um, and my editor chose that. Um, essay in particular because Fahrenheit 451 is such an important book to uh, the freedom to read and to librarians and Ray Bradbury um, wrote that book in the basement of the UCLA library. So it was written in a library and uh, that's perfect. Yeah, perfect. All the way up top. Can you speak a little bit about your writing technique? Writing technique was the question. Um, I write in a in a fury, just get out what I have to give out, get out, um, and then I struggle. <laughs> that's, my, that's my technique so far. Stephen King says in that book on writing that you have to write every day, even if it feels like you're just shoveling manure from one pile to the other. You said manure. <laughs> he did not say manure. But, um, and I find that to be true. The more I write, the better I write, even if I'm writing some junk. So I'm, this is my first, the young adult novel um, that I wrote when I was in college that did, never got published, just a little bit poured out of me. And this novel, I'm experimenting with trying to plot it a little bit more. Do you have a, do you, do you outline? I sketch outline, but I'm not tied to it. I'm always interested to hear what different authors describe their processes. Like George R.R. R. Martin says he's a gardener. You know, and then uh, another author says he's more like a mapper, like he has a, a beginning and an end, and then the destination. Who knows what you see along the way, but he knows where he's going. So I don't know if you have like a metaphor for your. We'll workshop. Not yet. We'll workshop. <laughs> okay. I'll try. I'll try. Other questions? When you do the book discussion groups from your um, at the bar, mm -hmm. how do you all keep the discussion going? What's your strategy for for um, having a good discussion? Um, I do, my book group's pretty talkative, um, so we don't have a problem with that, but in book groups that I've run in the past, the discussion has tapered off, and I tend um, to do a little bit of background information on the author, or um, I read a couple interviews or watch a, watch a YouTube interview, um, and if, if it falls quiet, I'll try to mention an interesting fact about the author and try to um, roll it back into the book. And sometimes you just end up talking about somebody's niece that moved to California and it's fine. <laughs> Come on, that, the, the beer and alcohol probably doesn't hurt either. <laughs> yeah. Right, you're yeah. Maybe that's why. Are you getting yeah, at a bar? Yes. My group is open to discussion. Yeah. Right. I enjoyed your book, your book very much. Oh, thank you. I got it from the recommend section of the Buford Library. That's where oh. I got it there. Um, was there anything, any part or any letter that you would have included that you didn't or any that you would write now since the publication about any book? The oh, yeah. question was, did, the, did a letter not make the cut? I wrote um, a lot of letters to books that I read as a kid and I had to cut some of them because they were just too similar in content because um, I tried to hit like every emotion you feel when you're reading a book in the letters and a lot of the books I read as a kid were just goopy love, you know, um, <laughs> those are the books you remember. So a couple of those got cut out. And then um, I recently read, I think the best book I read all year that's not new um, was called uh, Sons and Daughters of Ease and Plenty by Ramona Asubel. And I would have written a love letter to that book because um, it was just so great. I, but I, actually instead of writing a letter to the book, I wrote the actual author and she responded. So. <laughs> Favorite love story? 
Yeah. I didn't ask sexiest book, which I warned her about, but we'll do love story, favorite love story. My, I, my answer for sexiest book was Tulip Think Fever by Deborah. I don't know how to pronounce it. I didn't it. want to say my answer, so I didn't ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, the best love story. Love in the Time of Cholera. I really like that. Yeah. I know. It's <laughs> creepy, but he's still waits for her for a long time. Okay. Any more questions, guys? I was expecting Wuthering Heights. Wuthering yeah. Heights? Wuthering yeah. Heights <laughs> is also a great love story, but it's a little dysfunctional. I mean, <laughs> you talk about it. You talk about it in the book. Do you talk about Wuthering Heights in the book? Yes. You always mention I just mention it in the back. The back third of the book is just book recommendations. Right, so it's not all just letters. It starts with letters, and then there's some sections that are sort of almost a bibliography you put together of good books, or if you like this, read this, and some funny ones too. Like if you're feeling, if you need an excuse to stay in, here's a good book you can read. Cool. It's great. So, but like I said, it really reads like a reader's advisory. So it would be a great way for a book club to pick up and see what you want to read next. All the way in the back. probably narrowing the breadth of what people are reading. Maybe it's getting them to buy more books, and that will lead them to other books. But um, in general, I feel like it's not, you know, you never, you could love The Virgin Suicides and also like a book about growing apples or something, and there's no way Amazon can know that. Um, so I really encourage people, even if they end up quitting the book, to start books that are outside of their comfort zone. What would be the best way to get a literary agent today? Good question. I guess. Start a blog. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the question was, what is the best way to get a literary agent these days? You went one round. Yeah, I, really, I went another. I'm the wrong person to ask because mine was quite serendipitous. You got, um, yeah, that was really, that was great. But, oh, but a good tip that I heard was to look in books that are similar to a book you're writing or hoping to write, and they most often think they're agent and um, to write to that agent. So, you know, if you write fantasy, look in your favorite fantasy book and, and find out their agent, and um, they'll be more likely to go with the book. Right. What, do you, what do you think about uh, self-publishing? I think it's great. Yeah. It's another avenue to get, to get your work out there. And certain books are, are probably more geared toward that than others, especially if you're trying to tell a local story or something like that that, that might have a, some, a platform you can speak to locally. Um, uh, speaking to agents that also, uh, you know, don't be afraid, you know, they're just humans and, and, and people too. Don't be afraid if one rejects you, maybe ask, hey, who do you think might like this book? They might not have time to reply to you, but they might say, yeah, I know a guy. And that's helped me along the way. Uh, how you, you had a great experience finding an agent. That was great for you. How I managed to finally get one was just a little breakout with the South Carolina First Novel Prize. So I would say find the contest competitions. Um, you know, obviously the traditional way was to sort of slowly build up publication credits, short stories, and things like that. But that can be really hard to do uh, unless you write a lot of short stories and magazine articles. But So, so find a, a little way to put yourself apart, uh, just something to tag on there as a credit, and it'll, it'll catch their eye if they know that you've done something. Okay. Um, yeah, double dipping, sorry. So, um, I haven't had a chance to see your book yet, and, but you, you, talk, you characterize it as essays. In a, it, it, are the letters like the no, they're letters. Um, I just sort of use the word interchangeably. Yeah. Okay. That was it, too. I loved all the humor in it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, um, really great book. It's a funny book. And I had never really I thought about kind of just going to the library and anonymously checking out my books. Now I know that the librarian is looking. <laughs> and, uh, so that's, a, that's a whole other dynamic that it's added to it. And then oh. your stories about which books were checked out and used in which ways and without going into it. It just gave a whole new uh, experience of going to the library for me in a very good way. It has all these different layers that it didn't have before, which are the ones that are never checked out, which are the ones that go in the disposable bin. And what is the librarian really thinking about when I'm checking out? <laughs> 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 you, you mentioned 
a, a, like a, maybe a guy who's checking out like sort of uh, romance books for his sister. But, you know, <laughs> right, yeah. we, we pay more attention than you think, whether it's for the grown-ups or the kids. That's, that's our job is to get to know the readers. And, and a lot of times we don't know, you know, if you don't, um, if we don't see you a lot or if you don't stop at the reference desk, we don't know your name, so we just call you romance and book later. And, and, and no judgments. I mean, I don't know if it's just how I was raised or my personality, and I don't know if you feel the same way, but you cannot shock me. Like, there's no book. No, yeah. There's nothing. You could read anything on this planet, and I would be like, I, I understand why you would read that. A lot of people feel the need to, well, women feel the need to explain themselves when they check out my account. But men don't. They just say, where is it? I'll show it to me. I haven't read the book either, but I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm, I'm getting the impression some of the letters are, are like love letters, and some are more like Dear John breakup yes. letters. Is that right? Yes. 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 Some books, you, you're over this book. She wasn't talking know. that good about The Hobbit. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's personal. Some of them you never liked in the first place, or are, they, or, or some of them you've liked them all, and now you're over some of them? Mm -hmm. There are definitely some that I've read twice in my life and that mean something different to me. I think um, uh, Judy Blue's Forever I read. <laughs> I as really a, like that. As a child and then as an adult read and had a um, totally different, different perspective. Not bad, but um, just different. So yeah, I tried to I tried to hit every gamut and okay. originally the um, the subtitle to each letter was a, a reason for a breakup or a reason for loving someone. You know, like um, the letter to Anna Karenina was originally called I, I've Been Seeing Someone Else. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to run the gamut. Uh, as an author, do you uh, connect with other authors? Do you go to conventions, for example? Do you, are you invited to various things because you're an author? I've been invited to a few different... Um, I went to a, a first-time author convention, and I went to... a uh, Midwest Booksellers Convention that also had a lot of authors. And then um, I recently met some local writers that I started a writing group with, and that's been really helpful. Uh, other than book clubs, what is your favorite type of event to do? Do you like a panel? Do you like to be one-on-one? -on -one? Do you like sitting with an awesome librarian and having a conversation? <laughs> <laughs> this is really my favorite um, format this is because great, it's yeah. less, I don't have to um, give like a formal spiel. The spiel. The yeah. spiel is hard to do. Yeah. John. Yeah, I'd love to, for both of you to, to answer this question, because we're in a room full of readers, and you're both writers. What's been the most meaningful feedback you've gotten from a reader? Not a, not a published review, not necessarily even a, a, a customer review. One-on-one, -on -one, uh, letter, email, whatever it was. What was the most meaningful response you got from a reader? Um, I've gotten good and bad. I think that's been um, the number one thing people complain about. They don't know that about librarians. With cussing. Um, but I, I find it heartening that, um, that so many other people think about books in the same way that I do. And I've gotten a few letters um, that just say, like, thanks so much. I didn't think that anybody else cared this deeply about books or I, you know, have been able to laugh about books. A lot of books about books are more serious and make you feel like, like I don't read enough. Um, and I guess I make you feel that way, but that's not my intention. Yeah. Um, I just then, read a lot of picture books. Yeah. And another heartening thing was that a lot of women emailed me to tell tell me that um, they were annoying their husbands by laughing. And, like, being little it was about and I love to annoy husbands, my own. <laughs> For me, uh, you kind of got at it. I mean, number one, just hearing from an actual reader and not Kirkus or Library Journal is, is much more meaningful. Obviously, you're thrilled when you get a trade review. It's amazing. But uh, a real-life person is so much more meaningful. When I was a boy, I would lay in my bunk bed at night with a flashlight, kind of hiding. I don't know if Mom would have really cared if she caught me, but I would read the Chronicles of Narnia. I read them all through, you know, not just the first one that everybody reads, but all of them. And it just gave me that adventure feeling in my stomach. And I said, all I ever want, if I get to write, is to have one person lie in a bed at night and read my book and have that same feeling of adventure. And, you know, I, 
gotten many, many emails to that effect, but just recently a neighbor of mine uh, found out I was a writer because I was having a library event right nearby. And she texted me in the middle of the night and said, I just finished it, and it was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'd be able to do it. All right, it's 12:30. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you.